Uh, Oliver is going to talk to us about um, bringing live two games. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully he'll join us in a second. Um, da, da, da. So, hey, Oliver, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm Did good. we answer Can your question? Him? Okay. Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, I, I but it was a genuine question actually because oh, okay. I, I've I've been working also with some external parties, and I do still feel that you know paid people that get paid to kind of assess a game, mm. um, they are still biased, and it's kind of hard if you want to have like certain let's say benchmarks where you say okay, this is going to green light the game to kind of go into a further stage. You can do obviously these kind of tests also very very early on then it's like okay um yeah how do i, I remove it's the bias we did a lot of this stuff with um, um it, you know i've i've done these like uh, user group researches uh, your research processes where you pay people 30 quid to turn up or whatever it is and then you observe them playing the key thing in those cases is that you introduce it as somebody else's game and you don't sit in the room with them. You watch them through either a camera view or a, or a, or a window. And it's not something that most studios can afford, and small studios anyway. But if you can make it uh, happen, it's a really powerful, you do get useful information. Yeah. So, you know. Anyway, I'm, I'm taking up too much of your time. Go for it. Uh, all, all over to you, sir. Okay, great. Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk uh, today. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me. Um, I'm going to talk about something that has been actually uh, popping into kind of the, um, the aura of games and mobile games, which are actual life events, like real world life events and um, how they have come into games. And I, it, you're probably aware of like, because there was a big uh, PR splash around it, of Fortnite bringing some uh, music into, into th their metaverse. Um, I know that, um, Minecraft is also working on uh, bringing like a live music event into into their game, and um, I think it's it's great to kind of um, um, do something there. And we've I, I'm working for um, Lockwood Publishing, I'm chief commercial officer there, and we've also had uh, quite a bit of experience around this topic. And I thought it would be interesting to kind of share um, our experience. So maybe first of all, a little bit about um, um, the company. So um, Lockwood Publishing has been running uh, one single app, which is um, a 3D virtual world called Avakin Life. So um, we are also a kind of metaverse in that sense. Um, we have today about um, yeah, north of 1.4 million players every day coming into the app. We have um, more than 3 million downloads every month. Um, and uh, what is interesting, our app is a very, very social application. And that kind of also kind of puts this into the context of like Fortnite and some other games, even though it's not a shooter at all and rather targets uh, like a female audience. Um, we have like a um, high friend recommendation or a net promoter score. Um, so 80% um, of our players actually recommend this app to their friends. Um, so it is very, very, as I said, it's a 3D virtual world. It's about creating an avatar that is, um, yeah, as unique as you, uh, with lots of customization options, um, lots of things that you can uh, do with it. And then basically you go into a virtual world and you kind of explore all sorts of different, uh, things and scenes and, um, and you meet other people, um, because that's, um, a lot what, uh, what the game is about meeting other people, uh, having conversations with them, making uh, friends in a virtual environment. Um, what is interesting is um, we're somewhere between a game and a social network. And you can see that also in the time that people actually spend in our app. Um, so on average per user per day, uh, we reach, and this is data from uh, before coronavirus. Now we're actually past the one hour, but obviously all of those applications have increased their times. Um, so we, we're kind of in, in, the, in the region of an app like TikTok in terms of the engagement that um, our users have with the application. And that is because it's, it's, um, it's a place to hang out. It's a place to meet other people. It's a place to have conversations. Now, in, with regards to LifeOps then, um, 
you know, we do a lot of life ops. And as Oscar mentioned earlier on this morning in one of the QAs, there is certainly also a lot of kind of clinical um, things to, to life ops in terms of monetization um, um, ways and, and these kind of things. And certainly we also do a lot around, around that. Um, but one of the key things for us is also kind of to be really predictably unpredictable. Um, and that also means bringing like surprise events into the game or relatively surprise events and doing things, you know, that, um, that were unexpected by our, our relatively large audience. Um, and one of the, the uh, things that we've been doing um, is music events. Um, so we've, we've been able to, to basically um, bring uh, smaller and larger events into, into, uh, into our app. Um, and um, yeah, I'm going to share, I hope the video doesn't stutter too much, but I'm going to show you um, a few things there um, to give you like an impression um, of what we've been doing. Come on, Atkins, let's dance. I so bad. Yeah, so um, um, these are some examples of uh, some of the concerts that we've um, oh, that we've been um, able to produce, um, and you know we're obviously not the size of Fortnite, um, and we're only on mobile, but you know those concerts have still reached uh, quite a lot of people. Um, We've had like with uh, one of the first bigger ones with uh, an artist from Warner Music in the US, Haley Kyoko. We had about uh, 1.7 million uh, concert visits. Each one of those was on average like nine minutes. So lots of engagement. Um, we had a concert that is more like EDM uh, with, uh, with a duo called Blaster Jacks um, earlier this year with about 2.5 million um, visits. Um, we have Another concert coming up this weekend with um, an American DJ and social media starlet called uh, Chantel Jeffries. Um, so yeah, we expect to have like similar, if not bigger numbers. Um, yeah, um, so that's what we've what we've been um, been doing. Now I wanted to share a little bit, like um, you know, why we've done that. What are kind of key aspects to consider, and you know, where does it fit? For which kind of game does it fit, um, um, and and you know some some of our kind of insights and learning. So I want to kind of really talk about like why why we did this, um, and you can obviously decide then for yourself uh, why you should do this. Um, you know, is it easy to do? Um, I think is is certainly an important factor, and then. Um, um, you have to kind of understand, especially when it comes to kind of music and the music industry, you also have to understand like, how do you create like a win-win scenario? Um, so when, when we talk about like, why should you do this? Um, I think one of the key things is, you know, is your audience interested? As I was sharing, um, you know, people are already in our app at least spending a lot of time and for them to, um, you know, to have something, uh, have an appointment to go to, um, is, is certainly great. And we've been doing music events now for quite a while. Um, we did do um, quite a, I think beginning of last year, we did do some research and it was clear. I mean, we kind of had the hypothesis anyway, but it was clear our audience, which is relatively young, um, you know, has a lot of um, attachment to music and artists. Um, so uh, that was, you know, there, there is also the whole, you can see that here on, the, on that screen, there is also the whole layer of like um, 
TV properties and these kind of things, but uh, definitely music is, is for the younger audience a big thing. Um, so for us to kind of bring music into the app uh, was, was definitely um, um, a great goal. Um, and then another important question is like, is it easy to do? Um, and I think that's something that from, from a um, company and product perspective, you really, really also have to kind of think carefully about. Um, we do a lot of life ops anyway, all the time. We publish constantly items, spaces, um, and, and events into the game. So for us, it's more like business as usual in a way, right? Um, for sure, it needs like lead times and all these kind of things, but you know, to kind of create like a stage and have an, an avatar there performing on the stage with some music is not something that we, in parts at least, don't do anyway. So for us, it was like just a natural extension. The big difference is that, you know, you can't do it just in time. You have like lots of approval processes and these kind of things. And obviously if you work with, with artists or with music labels, then, um, you know, um, things definitely um, take a while. Now we were lucky enough that we have kind of a, a strong life ops production pipeline anyway. So for us, it's then more about kind of scheduling that in. Um, like the first, the Haley Kyoko concert, for example, there the production um, took around like 10 weeks from start to finish. Um, I know that some other companies that do like music events also in their games, because it's not like naturally in, in their product or production pipeline, um, these things can then take uh, even, uh, you know, half a year or even longer. Um, but we're able to kind of uh, do this relatively quickly. We're at the moment, we're roughly at a timeline of about six weeks from like start to finish, meaning start when um, we have like a, um, a deal memo or like a, a contract and then kind of production because we also outsource a lot of things um, up to the actual concert um, that takes about six weeks. But the goal ultimately is to get to even kind of shorter cycles because we see a lot of engagement of our users with, um, with these kind of events. Um, it's a great opportunity for them also to create content, content like I was there, um, um, you know, participating in the, in the event, et cetera. So we, we do want to bring that down even further and that would allow us then to also do um, run even more um, um, concerts. Now, the key challenge I think and that we faced uh, was, you know, how do we create like a win-win scenario? Um, and I think it's really important to kind of understand that from, from all the different aspects because it's there, you have to kind of look at like, okay, what does the artist want? What, why, why would they do this? And the same counsel so for, for the label um, like if you're, if you're talking with a, like a bigger music label, why, what is their interest? What do they actually want to get out of it? And then, um, as important, if you want to create a win-win scenario is like, okay, what do we as like a, um, a developer slash publisher, what do we actually want to get out of this? So if I take an example here, um, an artist like Jesse J, I think she's also with Warner music. Um, if I'm not mistaken, because we've, at least had some conversations with her. Um, you know, she has 9.2 million followers on like social media. Um, so, you know, uh, I, would, I would argue that, um, you know, reaching out to um, a game that has maybe, I don't know, 100,000 daily active users or something like that. The question then is like, okay, does this make an impact? If you are, ask your, yourself, okay, what does the artist actually want to get out of that? If it's like a totally unknown uh, kind of band or, or a musician, um, you know, that has no social media following, nobody listens to them on Spotify, then obviously it's something completely different. Um, so, you know, you have to kind of look at it. Okay, what does the artist want? The artist, at the end of the day, they want exposure of their music and their brand, which is they themselves. 
right? Um, and if you're, if you're big enough, then you can actually provide that. But if you're very, very small, then that's not something that you can provide. And then the artist will definitely say like, okay, we could still do this, but then you have to pay me. Um, so um, at the moment, I think, um, you know, there is obviously a lot of interest from artists to do something uh, in, a, in digital. Um, so that's why we have a lot of interest also from all the music labels. Um, but at the end of the day, you need to be able to really contribute to that. If, if Jesse J can record something and put it on Instagram and reaches all their followers, um, you know, and um, your game is so small that it wouldn't make any impact, then, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard to kind of justify that for her. Um, all these, all these artists or all the bigger artists at least are kind of somehow involved with some uh, record label that still exists, even though they can go direct to a uh, consumer with uh, channels like Spotify. Um, but very often there is still very old school a label involved. And what they actually want is they want, they see this more as a marketing thing and their biggest interest is like, can we, or they make money on, on basically um, on the music them, itself, right? Um, so they are interested in, you know, does this drive visibility for the artist? Does this drive, um, you know, listens uh, in Spotify because that's where money um, is made, even though it may not be that much, like $3 per thousand streams or something like that. Um, you know, it's still, um, that's what the label wants. Um, for us, um, as a developer, yeah, we also have to ask the question, okay, what do we want? So for us, um, at Lockwood, it's kind of twofold. On the one hand, we do want to provide something interesting and exciting to our users, but we, you know, we can in, in theory also do this with a relatively unknown artist. Um, you know, it's still going to be an, a nice and exciting event. If we, if we can draw like a slightly bigger artist, we're not at like the top tier yet, but they are more interested these days. Um, you know, then you want basically that they, you know, talk about it, that they, um, that they basically promote it as on social media as well. So almost like an influencer in that sense. For that, they need to be extremely excited about this as well. So that means that the quality of any kind of production that you do needs to be really, really good. Um, and people need to um, you know, be very excited um, from the label, from the artist and, and the artist's management to kind of say like, okay, yeah, this is, this is something that, um, that we should be doing. Um, you know, they need to obviously and that's what also takes a lot of time. They need to approve all the assets, every word that you kind of mention, they need to, yeah, um, approve everything. Um, so that means that, you know, it, they will only really kind of go above and beyond on social media, if it's Instagram or YouTube or wherever, if they're also really excited. And we've had some examples of artists that were less excited, so to say, because they were maybe a little bit like, mm, not sure if this is so cool. Um, but we've had artists that were just so excited to be like an, um, an avatar in a game. And they basically were all over social media themselves where we didn't even ask for it. Our contracts, um, because we are interested in exposure also through the artists, definitely also foresee like some kind of a minimum in terms of what they are supposed to do um, in terms of social mentioning. But it's always nicer if they if they go above and beyond and don't do the absolute bare minimum. Um, one other thing that you know with a with a big artist um, you do have to kind of consider is they will want money. Um, they will um, want to kind of have some contribution. The label will want that as well. They want to basically bring an opportunity to the artist where the artist also feels that they can make some money. Um, right now, a lot of their um, money has been frozen in a way because all the concerts that they used to do, 
um, are not happening and that's not going to happen for the foreseeable future. So here in the Netherlands where I'm based, um, you know, we're talking that maybe even some of the early festivals next year are not going to happen. So for artists, you know, big concerts that could still be like a year away or something like that. And they're definitely looking at like, okay, how can I, you know, make money from my brand um, um, if, if concerts are not happening? So we've, we've basically found a way where we basically sell um, memorabilia um, in the game. So we basically create like a, st a bespoke stage outfit, for example, for the artist. And we then also sell that to our users so they can then buy that. And on that purchase, we basically then share revenues um, with, the, with the artist slash label. So that's... Um, um, that uh, was a, a good route for us to kind of um, um, also bring some money to the table. Um, it's, it will obviously be harder if, yeah, for certain games, it will uh, for sure be harder to kind of um, um, extract some, some additional money, so to say, from the users to then share uh, with the labels. Um, but I would definitely always avoid like, minimum guarantees or these kind of things, because I think that's just not needed anymore. Um, to give you like a little bit of an outlook, um, I do think like, um, you know, games have, have become such an important media that, you know, the big games definitely um, um, can provide that platform for, for artists, for any kind of, uh, for, for various art forms. Um, it can also go go further than that in my opinion like music is one one aspect but i do think like also some of the some of the bigger like tv ip rich ip that is out there um definitely um those companies are more and more looking at like uh ways to kind of um you know uh, take their ip further i think you know maybe five years ago or something it was like um a game studio going to like a big um, IP holder um, and saying like, hey, can we, you know, build a game? And I don't think the deals were very favorable. Um, today, I think that definitely has changed because as, as a games industry, we, we have so many eyeballs and are so uh, ingrained globally in like pop culture and kind of what matters to users. So I think, um, I think we're in a, in a much better position to, uh, to basically um, benefit from that um, and find some interesting IPs. So we, for example, just partnered uh, with uh, World of Dance, um, like a popular um, TV show of TV format around the world, because we have a lot of um, you know dance and animation. And if you look for Avakin Life on YouTube, you will see, besides some of the ways to hack the game <laughs> that you always have with big games. Um, you will also see a lot of content that users actually create um, where they, um, you know, uh, re-envision re um, um, songs and do lots of choreographies in terms of animations, etc. So for us, like World of Dance was a natural extension. Um, but that's, I think, still one month away or something um, kind of starting there. So that's, um, yeah, that rounds off uh, my talk. Um, I think I'm okay on time. I'm not sure, Oscar. You're doing fine, but yeah, absolutely fine. Uh, we've got okay. five minutes left for questions if anyone wants to ask them. Um, I mean, for me, the, the decision about going for kind of events like this, uh, uh, bearing in mind we, we did this in the old, old PlayStation days, um, uh, we had the SingStar space and they had a number of uh, big bands. Uh, yep. I vaguely remember Faithless. I know we were talking about Placebo, who is my favourite band of all time. They never actually did it, sadly. But we were literally having discussions with those that kind of scale of bands at the time. Um, and you know, it, it's it's a tricky balance to get right because I think you've got to have a a mindset of a venue if you're going to do it. Because I think a one-off is fine, but if you're going to do it consistently, it's got to fit with your audience and your audience are yep. going to expect it and look forward to it. And I do it. agree. Absolutely. I think like you said, you've got to have that kind of win-win mindset and realize what the uh, bands want. There are a ton of amazing bands out there who are desperate for any awareness. They're not the ones who got the two million audience, like you said. 
And exactly. So you kind of have to have to find the right balance there. Um, so how do you find that balance? I mean, uh, I mean, is it a decision you make at the beginning about what you're going to be? Are you going to be the find the new band venue, or are you going to be the top band venue, or do you? Is it a journey? It, it for us, it's a journey. We want to kind of just uh, you know give our users a, a wide range of experiences because we also have such a wide range of you know interests in our game. Um, so then then it kind of makes sense to kind of really do different things there. Um, and I mean, we have the ability because we're set up in terms of life ops production so well to kind of do these kind of things. I mean, we, we did like within, I think one or two weeks, we, we kind of kicked off and, and basically produced like a, um, a single release in the game for like an artist and these kind of things. So we can do also smaller things pretty quickly because we're in that setup anyway. But music has always been quite an important part for us and it's like an event to go to and for our users that kind of felt felt good and felt right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've been um, uh, talking to the guys at Atom Universe lately and they're doing similar things to you, uh, obviously, yeah. they're, they're on PC and console. Um, and, you know, for them, and they're not the same scale as you guys, but they found this, this um, moment of creating moments of of enjoyment for people to come in and share and expose new talent uh, to that audience has been really powerful. And what's something really interesting to them is looking for ways to create smart monetization models that can share revenue for those teams. So that means that they're not looking for the big buck guys. They're looking for people who have an audience. Yes, but maybe an audience that is willing to spend money on a digital t-shirt or, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and it's in creating those engagement moments as well. So, you know, do you create a VIP area where people who buy the VIP ticket for the free concert can go and actually have a conversation with that band? Those sort of things are the kinds of discussions that we've been having. And I think, well, I suppose the point of me saying that is really, I think there's so much scope depending on the game. Yeah. And whilst you guys and Atom are basically creating social spaces, even Fortnite is showing that the right audience, the right space, the right segmentation of that playing environment can create really powerful social moments. Absolutely. And I, I think there will be much more of that coming. Um, you know, I mean, Minecraft also announced that they're going to do like a music event in, yeah. in, in the game. And I, I, I do, I find it like, it, it's kind of a, an interesting thing. If you have like an MMO-esque kind of game, where people get together and can share that moment, um, you know, that's when it actually becomes really powerful and exciting. And, you know, we see that also in our in-game chat then, you know, once they go in and it's like, oh, wow, oh my God, this is so cool, et cetera, right? So kind of creating those, those um, you know, special mm -hmm. moments, as you said, um, that's super Im important for us as well, because the, we also have then the users that then also kind of, uh, you know, uh, push it out on social media everywhere, right? And that's very important for us. Exactly. And I, I noticed, Oc I, I recently went for the Oculus Quest. I think it's an amazing sort of step forward for VR. And they do a number of concerts uh, and performances yeah. and also, you know, interviews, you know. So some people sit on stage and they will talk and they will take questions. I, I, I kind of looking forward to seeing how you can make comedy work in this type of environment. I think that's going to be a bit more difficult. Well, we're starting as a next step or one of the things that we are doing is we're, we are going to kind of do work as we're working with uh, World of Dance. We do want to do something that is a bit more maybe like a dance battle kind of thing uh, in the game. Um, you know, we're obviously not only a dance game. So, you know, it will never be like a deep dance battle game, but it will be at least like some kind of interactive um, thing that people can actually do. Yeah. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. And I think that's the key thing in these spaces where, um, you know, games like yourself have emotes, they have reactions, something that's often missing from a mainstream game. Uh, and, it, you know, some, you know, if you've got a cooking mama kind of style game, maybe it's going to be more complicated to introduce this kind of thing. That doesn't mean it's impossible. It's just understanding how does your audience share and express with each other? And is there a relevant crossover? And it may be, you know, in inserting a uh, video live video stream of somebody doing recipes might be more relevant for that kind of game yeah. 
than something like you know having a live band you know having placebo on stage uh, yeah, i think it's important that you also really understand who your audience is and what they're looking for right um you know a cooking mama might you know you might have more like a i don't know if it's strong in the u.s you might have uh more success with i don't know like uh, country music or something like that for a kind of uh, you know a middle-aged demographic um, in our game that would probably not work so well I mean we probably still have some people that would enjoy it um, but you know it's not like it's not what what our audience would really want to see so as always it seems to me it comes down to understanding your audience and giving them something they love but equally understanding the artist and making sure that there's a good fit yeah, I think that's very right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, on that note, I'm going to say thank you very much. That was an amazing talk. And I think, you know, anyone who's thinking about games um, as a medium needs to understand that we are the largest form of digital entertainment on the planet. One third of the population of the world play games. It is bigger than music and movies combined. And I think during the crisis, it could even be, I haven't checked this, it could even be bigger than music movies and home entertainment combined it's getting close to that level so you know don't underestimate the power of games don't underestimate the power that we can bring to entertainment as a medium and, and thanks ollie for showing you sharing with us what uh, you guys that have been live are doing thank you bye